there are definitely going to be difficult times and no one but you can kind of go through the steps to do it. And so it's important to remember that. Welcome back to the Student Influencers Podcast. My name is Leslie and today I'm here with Kanetha. So we're really excited to get started today. So why don't we just dive in? Good afternoon, Leslie. It's such a pleasure meeting with you today. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, we're happy to have you here. Um, We usually start every interview with a few kind of get to know you questions, just so our audience can learn a little more about who you are, first of all. Uh, So where are you located? Uh, So currently, I'm living in New York City. Awesome. Quarantining slash social distancing with my family. Yeah. So that's really good. Perfect. It's, it's nice to hear that you guys are all safe and safe and sound. I know New York was um, hit pretty hard with the pandemic, so it's always nice to see that you're safe there. Thank you. I hope you're doing well as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, here in Canada, it's uh, we, we were under quarantine too, but we um, weren't hit quite as hard. So that's I guess that's good. <laughs> Either way, glad to hear you're healthy and safe. Yeah. Um, so where were you born? So actually, I was born in Bangladesh, um, and okay. that's where my parents are from originally. Um, and my, my family moved to New York City kind of when I was very young. I think I was less than a year old. Um, and since then, you know, we moved to Queens. I grew up in Queens and basically never left. I stayed in New York City for high school, um, college, and now medical school. And I guess, I mean, I definitely hold the stereotype of the... <laughs> New Yorker who like brags about where they're from um but like truly I couldn't imagine calling any other place home amazing um so what university do you go to so currently I'm attending the NYU School of Medicine um so I'm just about finishing up my third year of medical school so yeah I'm very excited to kind of enter into my fourth and final year of medical school kind of in the next few months um, and before medical school, actually, I attended um, my undergrad at Barnard College at Columbia University. Okay. Um, and I did a four-year program there. Um, and I majored in neuroscience and behavior and was a pre-med student. Wow. That sounds so fascinating. Are you hoping to kind of use that, um, all of the things you studied, like with your undergrad degree, are you hoping to use that? in your career to kind of focus in those areas when you become a, eventually become a physician? So I think when I um, decided to go into neuroscience uh, as a major, I was just very interested in kind of the mind-body connection and how, you know, our emotions can really play a part into our health. Um, and I found it was very interesting to kind of learn about the new and upcoming research in neuroscience. Um, after doing some of my rotations, uh, I've kind of moved away from uh, an interest in neurology to, you know, a broader interest in medicine. So, you know, hopefully everything that I learned does play a part, um, but it's still deciding kind of what I want to do. Right. Um, okay, that makes sense. Um, what are you doing right now? So you said you're finishing up your third year. Um, did you just finish that or are you still working on some last courses for that? Yeah, so right now, I mean, now it's kind of interesting because we're in this quarantine right. period. Over the last two to three months, I've been continuing my academic courses virtually. Um, So, I mean, I can give, like, some of the background for, um, you know, all medical schools across the U.S. are very varied, I think, um, and there is a lot of variation in the curriculum, but there is an overall general structure that most follow. And so, usually the first two years are spent in preclinical time where you're taking kind of more, like, lectures and classroom-based uh, learning similar to what you would do in college. Right. Um, and then that's kind of builds your foundation for the medical knowledge and your critical thinking skills. Um, after that, the next two years are usually spent doing clinical rotations. Um, and at NYU, we actually have um, an adopted program where we spend less time in our preclinical years and more time with the hands-on clinical experience. So over the last months, in a normal condition, we'd be kind of taking your elective time to kind of go into the specialties that maybe a student is interested in um, because it's usually around your third and fourth year, which is exactly where I'm at, where you kind of start deciding, you know, this is where I want to pursue for residency. And so Mm -hmm. 
it's an exciting time. So stay tuned. Hopefully I'll have a better idea of kind of what I want to pursue. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can start that um, once the pandemic is kind of over, I guess. Um, then you can kind of get back to your clinical stuff. I guess that's probably the plan. Yeah. So uh, we, you know, got word recently that we'll be starting back up in July. Okay. Um, I'm looking, so I found myself kind of drawn to the surgical world of medicine. And so I um, want to explore kind of the subspecialties like ophthalmology, which is like an eye surgeon mm -hmm. um, or otolaryngology or ENT where the surgeon kind of focuses on like the ears, nose and throat area. Okay. They do want to do something uh, either procedural or surgical. Um, so I'll be kind of delving right in and hopefully I'll have a bet. I mean, you can't choose these things without seeing them in person. No, definitely not. <laughs> That's definitely something that takes a little bit of, okay, I tried this. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what made you decide to take this career path and go to medical school and um, take this direction? Was it something that you always kind of wanted to do or was it something that you decided maybe later on? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, it's a good question because it's actually funny. I, I still to this day have conversations with my friends and family, you know, how did I come into medicine? Was there a moment in time? And you know, there's not necessarily an exact moment that I can pinpoint. I just, I really can't imagine a time where I didn't want to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, now, I can't imagine myself like waking up every morning and doing anything else. So, you know, medicine really did always feel like my calling. Um, I guess my introduction to medicine was not necessarily a very unique experience. Like many other people, my first experience was with, um, you know, with, with, uh, like illness was when my grandmother was uh, hospitalized for a serious heart condition. Um, and I was very young. I think I was like six or seven years old. Um, but I remember being so, you know, fascinated by her you know, illness and kind of what we were doing to make her well. And um, really seeing her heal after her surgery and just someone who was complaining of all of these different problems now you know, healthy and kicking. And it's interesting because she actually was hospitalized at Bellevue Hospital, which is the public general hospital that's associated with NYU. Okay. Um, when I was younger, I think my mom told me, I don't remember this, but my mom told me that I told her, like, I want to be a doctor. I'm going <laughs> to like exactly this when I'm older. I want to be a cardiac surgeon. Um, and 20 years later, like almost 20 years, yeah, 20 years later, um, you know, my grandmother is still healthy and kicking. And now I've walked through those that exact hospital and like taken care of those, you know, patients with my team. And so, you know, that was kind of my, my grandmother's illness was kind of that, uh, you know, spark for me and right. really brought in this perpetual curiosity of kind of, you know, how the human body works, you know, what things can go wrong. And, you know, I was just fascinated, like more importantly, when something and so, right. you know, that was when I was young. So I didn't really have an understanding of what it meant. So throughout high school and college, I kind of tried to take every opportunity that I could um, to really gain a better understanding of what that would mean for me. Um, and so I majored in neuroscience. I tried to shadow in the hospitals and do volunteer work. Um, but it wasn't just kind of that interest for science that kind of led me and kept me in medicine. Mm -hmm. I had been doing volunteer work both in um, New York City and my local communities, and I had the privilege of going to Bangladesh to do some volunteer work for the community there. And, you know, I think it was really that experience that solidified that medicine would perfectly marry my, you know, love for science um, with providing a service. And, um, you know, learning, I want to dedicate my life to kind of learning those clinical skills and sharing that service or, you know, that knowledge and that skill set. And so, you know, I'm so eager to kind of get started on my own journey. And I mean, I can't imagine another field that, you know, marries my love for teaching and service and science and also works with my personality. I'm like, always curious, asking annoying questions, always annoying <laughs> I've always, I'm interested in learning new things and problem solving. So all of those things really continue to drive me again and again towards medicine. 
Amazing. That's such an amazing story. And well, one, glad to hear that your grandma is doing better. But uh, that must have been so surreal to just even just being in that hospital later on. And was like, this is where I made this. Well, not really where you made that decision. But this is like kind of what inspired you and having I think I feel like that's what makes someone like a really good medical professional is just having that experience and knowing what it's like to have a really good either doctor or surgeon or someone on your side helping your family and remembering that impact that someone made and having that first firsthand experience is a really amazing way to have that inspiration to want to have that for other people. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think I always, you know, keep this in the back of my head. It's like, no one will remember kind of what you told them or what you said to them. For example, when we're always trying to explain all of these, you know, big diseases that are important, but what they're going to remember is kind of how you made them feel at that time. And yeah. my grandmother, every time I talk to her, she always says like that surgeon was you know, one of my favorites and he just made me feel comfortable. And so that's kind of hopefully what I, I hope to embody and I hope to kind of remember as, you know, we go through this journey. It's amazing. I mean, that's, I, that's the quote. Cool, I think that's one of the best, because when you become a doctor or a physician or a surgeon or anything like that, it's really, you're dedicating your life to helping people and saving people. And I really think that it takes a certain type of person and it's pretty much the person I would picture to make like a perfect doctor would be exactly someone like you. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. <Leslie's. laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so while in school, I know right now it's kind of different because of the pandemic, but do, do, do you work part-time as well? That's a really good question. So um, while I was in, in college, I always worked part-time and I would highly, highly recommend for college students um, to do that just because, you know, it does seem overwhelming at first, you know, trying to balance school and work. But for me, really early on, it built discipline for me, and um, it really taught me kind of how to prioritize things and be efficient. I found that when I had more things to do, I used every hour in between better. Um, and I am a strong proponent of building professional and you know communication skills early. Mm -hmm. And each experience, whatever it is, whether it's um, you know like a very easy job to get and you're only there for a couple of months, like everything will add to your experience and your skill set. Um, so while I was in college, I did work at first as a camp counselor, um, both during the summers and in the school year. And then I eventually found myself into really interested in teaching and mentorship. And I know we talked about this uh, via email a little bit, but mm -hmm. just, I mean, we talked a little bit about my background. So, um, Kind of my own background as being a first generation Bangladeshi American immigrant, I'm I've always really thought critically about, you know, these systemic barriers to education, to professional development. And, you know, I come from a very hard working background. My parents, both my parents always emphasize kind of the importance of education and pursuing these academic opportunities. So, you know, I really tried to push upon myself to, you know, break barriers that did come my way and try to find financial opportunities for um, scholarships and free test prep so that I can like transfer to magnet schools or specialized high schools. And, you know, eventually when I came into college, it was a little bit discouraging to see that, you know, maybe I didn't have as much as many connections to the medical field to research and to volunteer opportunities as perhaps my peers did with family members within the hospital. And so, you know, that's what kind of gives you a competitive edge. So it was, discouraging at first, but what I found most useful were the mentors that I had made. And these mentors, when they're, you know, respectful, but they're really on your side and advocating for you, when you put in that hard work to improve with their constructive feedback, it's been a phenomenal journey. And I owe all of that, those first steps to kind of these great mentors. And so with my own education and professional journey, I was inspired during college to kind of devote my free time to tutoring and mentorship, especially with first generation students like myself. Um, so, you know, however small it was, I had some part in unlocking, you know, their potentials or connecting them with kind of the resources or other mentors and teachers uh, so that, 
you know, they have just as much opportunity or, you know, a better stepping stone to get to where they want to. And so that's been really phenomenal. And I've loved kind of using my part-time job to work with teaching because there's always like an intersection with medicine and something that I can do. In medical school um, and for other professional schools, it is much more difficult to work part-time. They actually kind of discourage it um, just because they want to make sure that, you know, you're getting the knowledge that you need. During my first two years, I um, was lucky to find myself in like a, in a virtual kind of experience where I could work uh, for a medical education platform. And um, they were very flexible with my schedule, which was great. Um, and it really gave me an insight kind of to that other aspect of medicine. How is medical education decided on? How are things changing? Um, so that I'm a two, I'm a kill two birds with one stone kind of person where it's like, if it's efficient for both, then do it. But if mm -hmm. not, that any part-time experience can really strengthen your, your skill set. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that makes sense too, that they would want, especially in medical school with something that's so like, all of the information you're learning is so vital for like everything you do that they would want to make sure that you're balancing everything okay so that you're absorbing all of that information effectively because it's obviously it's very it's very important to do that so that makes sense there's uh there's a lot of information but the other part of it is it's not always like structured i know that some professional schools like business school allow you to do like a part-time um schooling and so you can work um during your off time but medical school, it's like structured while you have classes in the evening. And so if if you're able to find flexibility, that's great. Um, but I think it is a bit more difficult. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you're obviously medical school and your program, um, especially with you being at NYU, which is a big top medical school, um, this is probably pretty tough, um, like work-wise. How do you kind of balance all of your responsibilities and all of the other things that you do that you're interested in? How do you kind of balance all of that without burning out? Uh, burning out. That's, that's like such a great question. And I'm, I'm really, actually, I'm very glad you brought it up because, you know, my experience at NYU has been incredible. The journey has been great. The um, people that I'm surrounded around are so inspirational. You know, just in the last three months, the way that everyone has come together to volunteer and provide and get PPE or mm -hmm. protective equipment, um, personal protective equipment and, you know, disperse all of this information to all the communities in New York City. The way that everyone mobilized was very inspiring. And so it's things like that, that just, you know, it's not just a school, but a community. And so that's been really great. But yes, I mean, burnout, it's so important to address because, it's a, you know, it's a concept that we're hearing a lot about. We use it in our, you know, own lives and in our own um, kind of just talking to our friends and family. But now I'm hearing it a lot more in the media, too, and um, rightfully so. I think it's mm -hmm. important to talk about. Um, and I think particularly in the field of medicine, um, there is a lot of changes that I think need to be addressed from an administrative and financial perspective, for example, you know fair hours for physicians, you know, things like loan forgiveness in the United States, um, reevaluating the time, the fraction of time being spent doing administrative work versus your clinical duties. And so that kind of all comes from a systemic level. Um, but kind of going back to your question, kind of what did I do on an individual level? So, you know, there's a couple of different things. So the first important thing to remember, and I think um, I've heard this from other students as well, is that you're completely at this point in your life responsible for your own education. So, you know, I've been lucky to have supportive friends and family. I came into medicine without external pressures and um, realizing that my, you know, decisions are internally motivated are, makes it easier to kind of continue through the challenging things um, that everyone and I myself have faced so often. So, that I think is a really important point to come back to and reflect on for myself. Um, the other thing is uh, learning to study kind of smarter and not harder and um, 
like using your time effectively. And so for me, organization and prioritization is key. Like I am a hundred percent a journal person. Like <laughs> all my gifts are journals and <laughs> highlighters and anything that kind of gives the illusion that you have your life together. Um, but you know, I have always written down my tasks for the week in advance. Um, but I do use Google Plant calendar now more just to kind of outline my lectures. Um, but you know, there are two things that I've used through college that may be helpful for some of um, the listeners. So uh, one thing is, and I'm sure none of this is like brand new information, <laughs> um, the Pomodoro method. I yeah. use, so like, I'm sure you know, but 25 minutes long. And that means like without my phone, without distractions, because, you know, I have trouble kind of getting started with the task. So if I tell myself at, you know, 4 p.m. I'm going to start this thing and I promise I'm going to start at 4 p.m. Then I set a timer for 25 minutes. Once I get started, I can continue. Um, and taking healthy breaks for those five minutes, like actually getting up out of my seat and walking around, um, you know, getting some water, healthy snacks, like those are really helpful. But I think the way I've seen it being used, like I don't use Commodore Method every single day of my life because I think that when something is useful, um, but you make yourself do it, it becomes aversive. And then you don't want to take something that like you actually find useful to then just throw it out because it's, it's just getting like almost like a task that you have to do. And right. so, so I kind of only use it when I'm really crunched for time. Uh, and then the other thing, I don't know if there's like an actual name for it, but um, it's called like the four box method. Um, so basically you kind of draw out a two by two table um, and this is helpful for prioritization. So at the top columns, basically you're trying to divide out tasks based on urgency and importance. Um, so at the top, you label urgent versus non-urgent. And on the side, you label important versus not important. And that's kind of how I outline my tasks for the day. So, you know, it's easy to be like, I'll start with this easy task and then use up all your energy for that and not want to get or um, procrastinate for the harder stuff. And so for me kind of outlining that and realizing like I really need to get A, B, and C done first. And just, I'm a visual person, so seeing that on paper and kind of ticking it off as I go is satisfying. So those are kind of things that I like really try to help myself prioritize and just get things started and just do them. Um, and then overall just keep like, try. I know it's easier said than done, but keep a balanced life, you know, practice the things that make you happy and rejuvenate you. And so, those are kind of the tips that I've still been working on, but hopefully have gotten better since the beginning of college for sure. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I've heard, I mean, we, we've talked about um, like homework help global. Um, we talk about the Pomodoro technique a lot, but I've actually never heard of the, the one. I mean, I know you said you didn't remember the name of it, but the four, that four boxes one, I've never heard of that before, but I feel like I, now I want to try it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like not something I made up at all. I like heard about it from the internet or someone yeah. else video, but um, really it's, it's, it's exactly what we try to do in our own heads, but really making a deliberate practice of deciding you know, this is urgent and important and therefore needs to be done now versus, Hey, this is not really important or urgent. So let's not focus on it now. And so, yeah, if, if you try it and like it, let me know. Yeah, I will. I'm going to try that with my own cause that's, something I've had to a bit like working from home like being in a position where I work from home all the time like not just during a pandemic uh I am always looking for like new things to try so I'm gonna try that one and I will let you know if it um if it helps me a lot I'm sure it will yeah, if you like. and yeah I mean this is all out the window right now that we're in a pandemic yeah. you know usually when I'm trying to focus that's kind of the stuff that I try to get myself to do some work. <laughs> yeah, that's the, no, that's that's all super helpful. I mean, um, sounds like you've really got a routine narrowed down for um, helping yourself stay on track. So obviously, it's working for you. Well, and it, it is subject to um, fluctuation, which I think any good routine should have. Mm -hmm. Right, it's kind of boring, but yeah. So still figuring it out, but that's kind of what's worked so far. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Um, what are kind of some of the, I know that we talked a little bit about how self-care plays a role 
um, in just balancing out and, and avoiding that burnout. Um, but what are the, some, I know this looks different for everybody, uh, but what are kind of some of the things that you do to prioritize your self care? Yeah. And, um, you make a great point. It does look different for everybody. Um, and it, it looks different for me on, you know, different times mm-hmm. in my life as well. But, you know, one of my favorite things that I've gotten used to doing, and honestly a very easy thing to do is kind of take long, aimless, solitary walks where I just kind of blast my music. And, you know, I remember doing this part- on a particularly diff- uh, difficult uh, hospital rotation. And it was the dead of winter. And, you know, by the time I got out, it was dark. And I just, all I wanted to do was kind of go home and go to bed. But I would force myself as I was leaving the hospital to just kind of start in a direction and walk aimlessly. And just listening to my music and kind of the cold air hitting my face, something about it was therapeutic. And so I really got used to doing that since then. Um, Other things, you know, my friends would describe me as an extrovert. I would counter that and say, like, I'm more like an introverted extrovert. But there are times where, you know, I want to step away from my medical school bubble and see my friends and kind of just chat in a coffee shop for hours. But then there are other times I kind of just do a face mask, um, you know, and take a long nap. Or the other thing I've gotten really into is journaling. Um, And you know, it's been so helpful for me because it helps release some of all the thoughts that are going through my head and just um, release some of that stress and anxiety after a long day. I usually do that at night. Um, And like listen to YouTube and like cover artists. So it's like inspirational to me. And so I don't know, there are a lot of different things, but it just depends on the time of day. Yeah, I get that. I mean, you know, you don't always feel like doing the same thing. (laughs) What was that? Sorry. What, what are some of the things you, because I always like to learn from others what their self-care routine is like. Uh, I, you know what's funny is no one's ever, I'm always the one asking the question, so I've never actually thought about that from my perspective, but I would say probably just like playing games or just like being with my, because I'm a pretty social person, so like being with my friends, um, just even if it's just doing nothing, just, just physically being with them really helps. Or reading is another thing I do a lot. I've always kind of wanted to try journaling, but haven't. I just like never get around to it. So I might try that too. But also just like watching TV and movies is a something that I do a lot. I forgot to mention that was like <laughs> my favorite. Yeah, I think that that's I think that's one of those things that's a pretty common self care thing for just about. I think that's something that everyone kind of shares. Yeah. is that movies and TV because there's so many different so much different variety out there there's always a way to find something that works for um for everyone yeah and I agree with that but I challenge people to kind of find a way to kind of because I think the idea of like getting out of your comfort zone whether that's your sofa or your bed and just like taking a walk does something to your body and um it just makes you feel that you've changed up a routine um, because sometimes I'll like watch Netflix all day, but then still feel drained of my energy and it just depends. Yeah, I get that too. Um, yeah, I totally see what you mean there. Um, so going back to kind of talking about, um, the kind of structure of medical school and, um, kind of how that path really works. Um, what, a, what advice would you give? Uh, for future students who are considering medical school. Um, I know you said that you, uh, originally when we talked before, you said you had some MCAT tips to share as well. Um, So kind of what advice would you give to medical school students? And if you want to share those MCAT tips, um, I'm sure that would help a lot of people too. Sure, I'm happy to do that. I think one of the number one questions I do get is kind of, do you have any tips or tricks for the MCAT? Um, But I guess even before that, so general advice, I think for pre-med students, it's, you know, it's important to acknowledge definitely that medicine is competitive. So your MCAT score and your GPA, they do matter. And it's what's going to help you get your foot through the door. Um, But I think many people tend to forget, I myself, you know, have this issue, you have to remember that um, it doesn't tell the whole story. So I think you know, it's becoming more and more attractive when students are well-rounded, 
Um, and well-rounded can mean like, yes, participating in research and school activities. But I think, you know, understanding at a deeper level what your passions are and how you find that balance. Because like we were talking about, it's so important to keep grounded during stressful and challenging times to avoid burnout. And I think that's also on the mind of the um, people who are going to be interviewing you and looking at your applications. They want to make sure that you can not only go to medical school, but succeed. And so more and more students are opting for time off between um, their undergrad and their medical school career to take gap, a gap year or multiple gap years to pursue research or another opportunity. And I, I did that. I took a year off and I did research and I traveled and it was just such a good time. And it was one of the best decisions for me. So I would say, you know, general advice, like don't be afraid to explore other avenues, even if there aren't direct intersections with medicine, because you want to make sure that this is the field you want to do. Um, yeah, that's kind of like more of a general tip that I, I wish that other people had encouraged me to re really think about because we do get really caught up in, you know, grades and numbers. For sure. true. Yeah. Um, and you're right. So the question, so, but then the MCAT is definitely, <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about an experience. I mean, you know, I, uh, definitely tried really hard in school. I was always like the nerd that's always in the library um, and I, and I took my science classes and I, I did well, but, uh, oh man, I remember taking my first MCAT diagnostic and this is like kind of embarrassing, but I, um, the, the score that I had gotten would not even be a passing mark for the exam. And so, you know, by the, I was a little bit discouraged for sure, to say the least. Um, but I, you know, in studying, I, you know, was lucky that, you know, I had the resources and I had the energy to keep going. And so by the end of it, I went up maybe like up to 20 or 30 points and scored in the 97th percentile, which you know, was, was a very difficult but proud accomplishment. And um, so that was really exciting. But it definitely required, you know, a lot of work. And I think the key was uh, to stay, like anything in life, persistent and consistent. Um, I'm sure you can, I like sound like a broken record, but like planning and writing down kind of your schedule is, was key, especially when you need to be very diligent with your time. Um, and with that being said, like, of course, you want to stay consistent with your schedule, but build in time to realize that maybe you overshot or underestimated how much time certain things will take. Build in good breaks. I think during the MCAT was the most diligent I was in my life. Like, I was exercising. I was going to bed at, like, an absurd time and waking up <laughs> at 6 a.m., which if anyone who knows me knows that I would never do that willingly. <laughs> I did do that, and um, it really paid off just to kind of be very diligent with that. Um, other kind of tidbits for me is really practice space repetition, um, and active learning. So what, by that, I mean, instead of kind of just reading through and highlighting certain texts, like summarize those concepts in your own words, in tables and charts, um, and in different ways. And for space repetition, I highly recommend flashcards or, doing questions that are um, not by sorted by topic, but as like a random generalized. So you're seeing everything kind of all the time. Um, so that that was really helpful for me. And there, there are a ton of flashcard services that students have already made. So you don't have to spend time making them, which, you know, is not always the best use of your time. Um, but I think the game changer, and this is like not a secret, is practice exam. So take as many um, as you can while also being efficient because, you know, taking the exam is a feat. Like taking a practice exam is a feat because it's an eight hour long exam, which is like a full work day. I mean, no one's paying you to do this. You're paying to take these exams. So right. it's definitely a feat. And, um, the more important part of it though, is to review the exam. So if, an, if I took an eight hour exam, I would almost use double that time to review my exam. And I would review my correct and incorrect in the same manner. So there are a couple questions that I would um, encourage you to think about. So why is the correct answer correct? Um, why is the incorrect answer incorrect? And if you can go through each of the answer choices and ask yourself, 
what can I change about the answer choice to make it correct? Because I think that that's what test takers do. And that allows you to get into that mindset of a test taker. It's like, how did, because they usually make five correct answer choices and then switch around certain things. So that means that you really know that information. And then the key for me in the leader part of my setting was to realize not only kind of what I was getting wrong or not wrong, but why. So was I getting things wrong because I didn't know that particular content? Then great, I can change my study plan to go over that content, drill it, and know it for next time. But if it was something like I was running out of time or I read the question incorrectly, that's a test taking strategy, which means that just the same way that you focus and drill content, you need to focus and drill test taking skills because you don't want the time for you, you don't want to be in the exam and be like, man, if only, you know, I strengthened my test taking skills, I would have gotten this correct. Because there's two ways to get to an answer. And so if you're able to kind of address both of them, I think that's, that's really helpful. And that kind of you'll see your your points and your score going up after that. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's a really good point you made too. Um, when you're talking about the flashcards. Um, when you're testing yourself, even if you're not using flashcards, just if you're testing yourself and mixing up kind of what you're testing yourself about and kind of um, doing more of like a mixture instead of doing one subject at a time when you're studying or one topic at a time when you're studying for a test. I think that's a really good point too um, because that'll help you if you know like, okay, we're, st we're going to study for this particular topic, then you know the answer is going to be within that range. And I think that's probably a better way to test what knowledge you've actually retained is if you can answer it in random order. So I think right. that's a really good point too, that I just kind of pulled out. I know yeah. you had a lot of, I mean, a lot of your points were really, really good. Um, but that's one of the ones that I was like, Oh yeah. Like yeah. as you were saying, and I was like, that's a good idea. Thank you. And yeah, I've gotten that advice too, because I used to definitely learn through topic based like questions and, um, only focusing on that topic, but I think it does two things like you start your mind can shift from one thing to another So you're not Constantly bogged down and you're you said it perfectly You're not coming into that question with the umbrella of like hey I'm answering this type of question So it must be this answer because on on the real exam. That's not what happens you mm -hmm. get And I think that that can definitely trip trip you up especially under high stress and you need stamina It's a long exam. So Anything you can do under test conditions, I think you should. Yeah, that's a, all of that too. And I mean, all of that, like doing that is preparing you for those test conditions. And same with what you were talking about um, with taking the practice tests and t doing all the actual like testing strategies. I think that's, that's um, those are all ways of kind of training yourself for the actual test. And I think that's probably the most effective thing to think about because that's what's obviously, that's what's going to happen when you're, taking your test so it's it's probably the best thing to kind of think about for that that's one break because it'll be so easy to be like no i don't need that day off and then hashtag burnout again yeah so. <laughs> yeah definitely um yeah i think all of that's gonna be super helpful advice for anyone listening who's interested in um even just a career in the medical field, not necessarily med school, but. Yeah, and any, um, standardized test take, any standardized test, I think, applies very similarly. Yeah, definitely. Um, moving to a kind of different topic here. Um, so even after talking to you um, and even um, like seeing your Instagram page before, you have so many different pictures there. Um, of all these different adventures and traveling and exploring that you've done. Um, is that something you do all, like, how do you fit that in with everything else you have going on in your life? Thank you. That's so kind of you to say. I mean, traveling seems like ancient history, right? <laughs> um, I mean, so I guess, so I remember being very young and my mom and her sister, so my aunt, who I consider a second mom, always telling me stories about kind of their travels and their work abroad. So I think I grew up with an eye for wanting to travel and be going on adventures. Um, and so before college, I traveled mostly with my family on family trips. But 
after college, um, I became, I started kind of going on my own travels with friends. And you're absolutely right. There is a challenge in fitting this desire for travel and exploration definitely into a medical school um, kind of schedule. But I think like most things in life, you have to be resourceful. So for me, I guess it was finding this balance of, yes, planning out your time in advance when you have breaks, but also kind of remaining open to this spontaneous opportunity, you know, because you don't know when things can come up. So for example, I mean, anytime I knew that I would have some time off, I would plan, try to plan a trip in advance. And I'm lucky I have a few close friends that I would just, that are also down to travel. So I would just, you know, be like, hey, are you free on these dates? And would you be down to go to, you know, X location and try to coordinate with them? So, but in medical school, what that looked like would, would be like, I mean, a particular moment comes to mind because I remember, oh man, pulling an all-nighter, which I do not recommend or endorse, <laughs> right. but I, I did, I pulled an all-nighter and then I took a three-hour, very important exam, um, and I went back to my dorm room and I just quickly like, threw things into a suitcase and set out on a flight that evening. So. I knew that I wanted to make the most of my limited time, but that's, that's stressful. And that's not necessarily something that you can always plan for, but mm -hmm. you know, that's like a more of a planned perspective, but there was one trip I was like in my anatomy class and my favorite website is Google flights. Like I'm always scrolling through. Google flights. Um, and I remember seeing a trip to Amsterdam that was so, so cheap. I was just amazed. And I had a three-day weekend that was not like an international three-day weekend, so it wasn't expensive. And I texted my friend immediately and was like, hey, like, we need to go. It's this cheap. Like, ask for time off at work. And it just happened. And we planned that trip maybe five or seven days before we were leaving. And so that was more spontaneous on my part. And it was just, it was a three-day short trip to Amsterdam, which is kind of all we needed. And it was just so exciting. But for me, um, I know that there's an idea that traveling could be very expensive mm -hmm. and um, for students that's definitely a concern but I find that for myself I've always been taught to kind of uh, be you know value experiences over kind of material objects so for me I love saving money for for trips um, and I think that there are ways to get around especially when you're younger you know on flights and um, you know, only or a backpack and, you know, finding like hotels for cheap or use Airbnb. And so any kind of way I could get myself onto a plane and into that country, like I'm, I'm there because at the end of the day, it just travel was a way to rejuvenate my energy. And, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not necessarily the type to just necessarily like lie on the beach, but sometimes you need that, but more like really go to museums and see the, the culture and talk to the people. And so that's always been exciting. Yeah, do you think that kind of, um, that feeling, fulfilling that sense of adventure is um, something that it kind of um, is beneficial for students, like any students in general, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on kind of your personality, for sure. Um, and and travel can actually expose your, your personalities and see how you interact in a new place, um, especially if there are language and cultural barriers. Um, but it teaches you how to be humble and to learn from others. And so that has been really great. And as like some people really like to travel, um, with friends or family and some people really like to travel alone. And so kind of experimenting with what works best for you, if you can, I think is great. I am biased, but I would say, you know, if you're able to, um, save your money, go and if you get a part-time job and that's like a reward it's like a reward for you you to kind of you know be working so hard and be able to go abroad um so I would say yes I think it, if you're able to definitely try to travel and it could be it, and the thing is like you don't have to go far sometimes like even staycations or in the U.S. Yeah. I mean going anywhere in the U.S. is sometimes more expensive than going to Europe because things are just so expensive here but yeah. um it's like you can like take a road trip everything is so exciting so that's like to say that we have kind of the same thing here in Canada it's it's more expensive for us like we're in Ontario but for us to go fly out to like British Columbia is sometimes it's more expensive than flying to your somewhere in Europe sometimes uh, yeah 
weird. I don't get that. I know it's it's this I don't know I don't know what it is either but it's sometimes sometimes it seems like that and it's it's kind of crazy but so I know what you mean um <laughs> so you may be hearing from me to get them <laughs> yeah. always get tips from people who have lived there or live there because you just get a different yeah, that's definitely uh, a good idea. Because also, to talking to people who have been there, if, especially if they lived there, I find if they lived there, it's even better. But because um, they'll always tell you either stuff they've learned from making mistakes or stuff that they've discovered. And it's um, like, especially with people who live there, with their, oh, I actually stumbled on this little restaurant that's like off the beaten trail, but it's amazing. And that's where you find like the best food you've ever eaten. And things like that. It's always so helpful to know that. <laughs> Definitely. And even with forest things, like I remember asking like, hey, is this thing that everyone suggests even worth it? Um, so it's, it's just good to kind of do your research if you can have time. But uh, yeah, I agree with that. Definitely. Um, your Instagram is also full of pictures of you with like, um, being very influential with fashion and style. Is that something that you've always been into too, or did that kind of just happen because you just happened to be super stylish? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's such a nice compliment. Thank you. Um, I've actually, I've never considered myself to be, you know, influential in fashion or style. I mean, I generally do like putting together outfits. I mean, you gave me a great reason to kind of get dressed today, but, um, you know, it's funny because I thought I'd only be here for 10 days and brought like a pair of sweats and some PJs. And now three and a half months later, I'm still home. So I'm wearing my mom's clothes, but she's, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, I like any opportunity to kind of express myself through clothing. You know, I've sometimes found that putting on a fun outfit or a different outfit can kind of change my mood or, you know, sometimes it's, uh, gives you like a boost of confidence. So or for myself, like if you're in this very mundane schedule, every single day the same thing, something that you can change up is your style and that will kind of change things up. For me, I guess it depends because um, during like the colder months, like my favorite go-to is like jeans and some black booties. Like I have like five or six pairs of just black booties, but they all look the same according to my dad. But, you know, I have them. And then, like, in the summer, I'll, like, wear a dress with some, like, white heads. But it just – it depends. Like, my style kind of varies. So um, – but thank you for saying that. Not yeah, no I never <laughs> – It's just had – so it happened – it's kind of a – but I feel like that's kind of the best way because some people, I find that they try too hard to be, like, that fashion trendsetter. And it's just, like, you can tell when people try too hard – and when people, it's just come naturally. And it obviously comes more naturally to you, so. That's very sweet. <laughs> For me, it's like, it's fun, you know? It's like, instead of actually cleaning my closet, I'll just put on random pairs. I'm like, hey, that looks kind of nice. Like, let's try that. But yeah, that's awesome. Not a trendsetter, more like <laughs> for inspiration from elsewhere. But more you. like a sharer. Yeah, I like sharing. A style, instead of a uh, trendsetter, you can be a style sharer. I like that. That's like, that's, we'll, we'll use that. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll use that in your, in your blog. Um, what is one of um, your favorite memories so far in school? Ooh, that's a good question, actually. Um, I have so many. Some, I mean, right now, like, memories that are going through my head are definitely the big ones. So, like, graduation and my white coat ceremony, just mm -hmm. because, you know, I was able to spend that day with the people who, my loved ones and the ones that have been so influential in my journey with my friends and my family and being able to see them be so excited and happy um, is, is really phenomenal. But I'm also kind of a mush ball for like graduation speeches. Um, <laughs> you know, most people think they're so corny, but my mom is the same way. And so I, I don't know, I always cry during graduation speeches. But I remember that very well. Um, but I think, you know, I think all of the fun is in, like, the little memories with your close group of friends. So, like, in college, I spent all this time in the library, but it was always amongst, you know, the people that I would always be with. And somehow, you know, we made it fun. I don't know what we did to make it fun, but I don't remember. Like, I, I don't think I'd have it any other way. 
And at Barnard, we had these traditions like midnight breakfast where we would just, it sounds exactly like what it sounds like, but we'd have like whipped cream with like candy on top, just like the worst things you can possibly eat. And I just remember like that was such a fun night. Um, and then in medical school, I, uh, medical school surprised me actually. I, I'm surprised at how much time, especially in the first two years we had to work as a, be together as a community and celebrate. So um, at NYU, I'm on um, student council. So one of my jobs is actually to coordinate some events after a big test. So we have tests pretty frequently, um, like almost every two weeks. And so some of the activities that I remember is like dancing together the night away, like in different parts of NYC, like places I just wouldn't always go to. Um, we did something called bubble soccer. I don't know if you've ever heard of like the bubble sports. Is that when you're like in the giant plastic ball and you're like trying to play soccer while inside the giant ball? Is that what that is? Yeah, exactly. And, it, and honestly, it was so fun because it was after an exam and it felt like you're releasing all the stress because you can be violent and you'll, all you'll do <laughs> is fly to the other direction. Um, so that was, that was like a fun experience, but it was still like little, it's not, not like a huge thing, but it was like things like that that I remember and I think I will remember later on, you know. I think that sounds super fun. And that's <laughs> you because you could knock anybody over. They have a built in barrier. Yeah. So you're never going to hurt anybody. The thing is, you're bruised because your like knees are not covered, and if you fall, oh. so I was bruised heavily for the next couple of days. But yeah, you don't feel hurt until a couple of days. Until, <laughs> okay, so it won't hurt right away, so it's fine. <laughs> now I'm just nostalgic. Like I feel like I haven't seen so many people in so long. You know? I think yeah, I think that's a big thing. Is right now a lot of people are feeling, and like even I sometimes I think about I'm like ah. Oh, even just like sitting by in my parents' backyard right now would be fantastic. Oh yeah. Just because it, like it's been so long since anyone's been able to do anything like that here too. So I think that that nostalgic thing is really um, a big factor right now. Hopefully, you know, moving forward, we'll we'll get back to our what we used to call normal, at least in stages. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. In stages, we're about to in Ontario. We're about to start. Um, phase two, I guess. Oh, they good. started like phase one a couple of weeks ago. So, good. And are, how are the num- like the numbers have just been steady? I think they've been they were going down for a while, and then they started to go back up a little bit. But it was nothing like what it was before. It was like before it was like five hundred cases a day in mm-hmm. Ont- in all of Ontario. And now it's at like two something. I think the last time I checked. So. In the, we're moving in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Definitely. It sounds like New York is doing that, too. Yeah. New York resilience. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm proud of um, everyone here. Hopefully, we kind of stay that trend, so we'll see in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, hopefully. It's always a slow process. Yeah. Um, I know we talked about, like, some of the great memories. What are the, uh, on the flip side, what are some of the uh, struggles or challenges that you face? I know we kind of talked about, I mean, there's, um, dealing with like the time management stuff is probably a struggle in and of itself, but were there any other kind of challenges outside of that, that you kind of faced and overcame? Yeah. I mean, it's really important to consider both sides. Um, and the list of student struggles can really be endless, you know, and they span, you know, this wide range of like personal, financial, academic, but financially, I mean, I'm lucky because NYU um, School of Medicine is the first uh, medical school that went tuition free a few years ago. And yeah, and so that's a huge burden lifted off of and so far, like other medical schools, I do hope that they follow suit, but NYU is start of that. Um, And the thing is, like the average debt of US medical students is over two hundred thousand dollars, which is like it's not a small amount. No, so, huge burden that that was lifted off, and I'm really grateful for that. But I think speaking even more academically, I guess uh, some of the most difficult challenges are just during your periods of transition. So for me, it was coming into medical school and realizing that I have to relearn how I learn. So like. After 16 years of schooling, you would think that, you know, you have it down pat, you know exactly what works for you. Um, but I came to medical school and I heard from students and lecturers that learning 
in your first year will feel like um, drinking water from a fire hose. And that expression, I, I can't find something better to capture the feeling because that's exactly what it feels like. And the transition that was hard for me was realizing, you know, my old methods of kind of reading through a textbook and highlighting and rewriting my notes and rereading those notes just was not the right efficient way to um, kind of learn all of this material. It just became very unmanageable really quickly. Um, and that was very stressful, but I kind of looked to the upper years and asked them kind of how they dealt with that transition. And I learned new methods that did work for me. So some of them we talked about summarizing active learning, tables and charts, I started finding like, I really benefited from videos and module based learning rather than like from a physical textbook or an online textbook. Um, and so I've changed those ways. And that was that was a challenge. It took some time, like my first few exams, it took it, I definitely saw like um, fluctuation in my score. But I think what's important and the message that I want to get across is that medical schools and any other academic programs do realize that every student kind of learns differently. And so they have the resources and the flexibility in their academic program, even though it doesn't feel like it in the moment, to support you during this transition. And so it's really important to be honest with yourself and to reach out for help um, and kind of embrace those challenges because you'll learn to be resourceful and adaptable. Because since then, I've had to change the way that I learned every, with every year of medical school. Right, yeah. Different. I mean, you don't learn the same way from, you know, a lecture as you do from a patient. And so trying to kind of navigate that, you should, I would say, like really reflect for yourself, but also reach, reach out for help when you need it. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's a good um, thing to look at. I didn't know that that, new, that um, NYU was one of those, the schools with the um, tuition, did you call it? How did you word it? Well, NYU um, made medical school tuition free, um, which, and for all, like, so when I started, I paid tuition my first year. But after that year, every student who enters NYU will be um, granted a scholarship that makes their tuition free. That's so amazing. That, so that, that really, I think, alleviates a lot of burden financially, but also allows students to kind of make decisions on, you know, what career they like to, to pursue, at, you know, a specialty in medicine without feeling that they need to only focus on certain like ways to pay back their debt. Yeah. Cause I feel like if, if you're in medical school and you're paying all this money and suddenly you realize uh, that it's not for you anymore. And then I, you probably feel kind of stuck. Look, well, I paid all this money. So then you kind of force yourself to stick with it. But if you're not happy with it, then you're not happy with it. But having that huge, like hefty tuition can really put that pressure and, get you have end up with people being stuck in these positions that they sh shouldn't be in I guess definitely I didn't even think about that but yeah paying for medical school and at some point realizing hey like this is not it for me that's that's a hard burden to yeah to, for sure definitely um one thing we always ask every um person as well is if you could go back and talk to your 15 year old self, what would you tell yourself? So 15, um, <laughs> like high school freshman, I think. Yeah. So I was in high school, huh? Um, I mean, I wonder if this is an unpopular opinion, but I actually really loved my high school experience. And some of the, the friends that I made in high school are like my lifelong friends. Um, but I do remember I, um, uh, you know, went to a very competitive high school. And I remember to this day how much stress I felt every day. Like, it felt like I had to make a lot of difficult decisions about my future. And there was this, what I perceived to be an overwhelming emphasis on grades and applications. So it almost made me feel like everything I was doing in high school was to achieve the next big thing in my life. So I guess if I went back and told 15 year old Kanetha to uh, I would tell her to kind of enjoy the present moment um, and celebrate, you know, your successes, like however small they are and um, really not to stress kind of about all the small challenges because they're definitely not worth it in the long run, even dwelling on the big ones, the big stressors. It's, things just seem so small looking back with 2020 
vision. Um, and high school is just such an important time for your personal development. So I would tell her, like, learn who you are, what are your interests, really focus on your hobbies, take any negative experience and see what you can gain from that because that's going to help you for your long-term goals. Yeah, that that makes total sense too. I think I because I mean it's perfectly, and it, like I said, it is an unpopular opinion to love high school because high school has such a bad reputation. But I feel like a lot of people, like I about my own high school experience, I'm kind of so so. Like there were some good things and some things sucked. But I mean, I've met a lot of people who loved high school. So yeah, I like adore. Like I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> But I, I, ha- I, I can't really remember, like, such awful times. And maybe I'm just, like, looking back with, like, this golden, these golden glasses. But, um, yeah, I mean, I remember – I think the reason I loved it so much is the friendships that I made. Yeah, I think that's a big factor, too. Sometimes, sometimes you have those high school friendships that just – they kind of fizzle out because you kind of grow apart. But then other times you have those high school friendships that are just so – strong that like I'm I'm still friends right now my main friend group is my friends from high school so it can definitely be yeah it's definitely something that's um doesn't always happen but when it does it's it's pretty valuable friendships yeah I agree with that definitely um what I, I know we kind of did talk about this uh, when we talked about your advice to future medical students or people who are considering this career path, but what advice would you give to any student starting university this year? Not necessarily a medical student, but any student in general who is just about to start university or college. Yeah, um, that's a great, that's a good question. I think the advice that I received Um, that I loved and I want to share is to keep an open mind because it's very simple but college is such a great time to explore your interests and I think like toning that down a little bit more like thinking I think I would advise you to think more generally about who you want to be and as you meet more and more people what kind of characteristics you'd like to embody in the future and kind of what contributions to society you'd like to make rather than coming in with this, like, I want to be this type of person, because as you go through your years in college, as you start to acknowledge those factors and decide on your values, that those professional and academic goals can then align with those values rather than vice versa. And I, I, I think that that will then give you a much more fulfilling life because you've established who you are and then found a career that then kind of focuses on that and helps build that. Yeah, and kind of just be open to, I think the two thing too, to build on that is that a lot of um, university is a really big time for a lot of people to kind of discover who they are and the things they're really interested in. And it's not always necessarily the same as it would have been in high school. So I think that um, keeping that open mind and being kind of open to that is, is a good way to kind of prevent that. Well, this is what I want to be, but not really knowing kind of what you want to be, if that makes any sense. Oh, that's key. That's like you said that perfectly. It's just like, you know who you want to be as a person, but you don't necessarily know. First of all, what I don't even know what options are available for jobs. Like I'm still learning about things now and I'm like, hmm, that could have been interesting too. So just, you're right. Like just knowing like, hey, I want to be this kind of person and what that actually means will come, will come as you kind of go forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's... So pretty powerful advice that you have there. Very simple. And that's the advice I've gotten and I've, I've loved it. So yeah, it works. Um, do you have a favorite motivational quote that you would like to share? I think this has to be my favorite question that you asked on, <laughs> on your show, just because uh, from high school, probably I always like carry a notebook to like, any kind of lecture, if I'm watching a YouTube video, if I'm reading a book, and I write down things that, quotes that just sound really nice or just resonate with me. Um, The one I want to share, I think, is helpful, kind of in line with what we've been talking about, um, is from Robin Sharma, who is the author of the book, The 5 a.m. Club. And so the quote is, um, let me just pull it up. So it's, uh, give me persistence over intelligence. It's the hungriest who wins, not necessarily the most gifted. 
And, um, you know, the quote I think is pretty self-explanatory, which is what I like about um, Rob and Sharma is that, you know, he says what he means, but I think it's also really important to discuss because this is, this is how I live my life and how I view life because, you know, it's important to acknowledge we are all so quick to say like, hey, she did this because she's so intelligent or he did this because he's so passionate. But it's like, so are you. I mean, we all focus on how easy they make it seem because, or how easy their end goal seems for them. But, you know, you're not hearing about that entire journey and all of the challenges and times they had to hear no or, you know, the failures that they had to overcome. But they stayed persistent and they believed in themselves and, you know, they put in the hard work, they found those mentors. Um, and I think, you know, you have to find that inspiration because that's what's going to keep you going. And I don't know, the quote just really encourages me because there are definitely going to be difficult times and no one but you can kind of go through the steps to do it. And so it's important to remember that. I think that's really powerful because that also goes with the whole idea too, is that just because someone is the smartest person does not mean that they are the most successful because being intelligent is a, is a great thing, but it's not the only thing that matters when it comes to being a successful person or just like being um, accomplishing really good things in life, I guess. Yeah. And do you apply that intelligence and do you share that knowledge? Because like, I think one of the most important things for me is like, what will be my impact in the future? Um, and so I think it's important to not only have that intelligence or work towards something, but share it with others. And hopefully, you know, that's kind of the message I want to send. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that's a really amazing message to send. <laughs> Thank you. I really like that quote. I have a million quotes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounded like you were the perfect person to ask what your favorite quote was because you got a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one, the last final question we usually ask is more of like a fun question, and that is, what is your favorite social media platform and why? Ooh. Okay, this is an easy question because yeah. it's is definitely, definitely my favorite. Um, and it has been, I think, for some time now. Uh, you know, fun fact about me, I didn't – I don't know if I'm aging myself here. So, <laughs> I mean, I didn't have social media until – as a senior in high school. Yeah. Um, and I quickly, you know, found myself to Instagram because you know what I liked? I like that you have your friends and family and you can keep up to date with their lives, but then you have your explorative page where you can gauge all of your interests. And if you're like me and you scrolled like at this point, probably millions of hours, perfectly curating your feed. Like I have travel, I have photography, I have art, fashion, things like I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like very fun. Uh, and the, as I came to like medical school, I was inspired to kind of use my page as a creative outlet. So the quote on my Instagram is like, I'm studying 99%. It's so, it's so corny. <laughs> it's like, I'm studying 99% of the time. Um, here's the 1%. And so for me, it was like a creative outlet to kind of showcase everything that I am outside of medicine. Um, and the things that kind of also again, bring me, bring me life and joy. And so really seeing that block, like as an outlet for me was helpful. And I don't have like any, you know, I don't have like, I'm going to post at this time at this date. And it's, so it's not stressful. I just, it's like for fun. Um, yeah. through, you know, my experience with medicine, I also had been able to connect with students who are also medical professionals and find these mentors or create that small community. So there's been so many positive things about Instagram for me. And um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's a creative outlet. You need some creativity and like a science heavy life, I think. So I could definitely picture that. It's funny because you, you think you sound old when you say you got uh, Instagram, not until your last year of high school. I didn't get Instagram until like my third year of university. <laughs> oh, I didn't get Instagram. I got my Facebook. I, I meant social media. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, well. <laughs> Unless you count MySpace, mm. back in the day of MySpace. <laughs> I just, like, it's so funny because there are so many people that, like, don't even know what AIM is and MySpace is, and it's, like, that was the entire, like, I know. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. just, it's a good time to be born after 2000. <laughs> yeah. 
I know. I feel that. Um, so this has been super, super constructive. Do you have any um, final, like, last insights that you want to share before we kind of um, say goodbye here? Yeah. Um, can I share one more quote? So yeah, this is so simple. I've probably heard it, but a bad day for the ego is um, a good day for the soul. And again, like high school, college, medical school, all of these are four-year programs that go by so fast. So it's a wonderful time to kind of explore yourself, explore for yourself, but then leave time to grow and improve. Like we focus on our failures as setbacks um, rather than an opportunity to kind of humble ourselves and grow and learn. And it took me a very long time to get here and I'm working on it because, you know, there's always negative thoughts sometimes in my head, but you know, I challenge anyone listening to this to embrace those challenges, kind of alter that status quo to adopt that, you know, growth mentality. Because while we said, like, enter each experience with an open mind, like, I think you should leave with kind of a critical understanding of what you've learned from that experience. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, try to expose yourself to as many people. I think anyone from any field, whether they're older or younger than you, can can teach you something and you'll be exposed to the qualities that you hope to emulate, you know, as you kind of move forward. So that's the last message I have. <laughs> that's amazing. I think that's an excellent last message. I mean, you have been so insightful and so I think everything you've said has um, this whole time has been super um, inspiring. So I, th I really really want to thank you for joining us today because I think that our audience is going to learn a lot from you. I learned a lot from you. <laughs> Leslie, it was such a pleasure. I mean, the pleasure is all mine because you gave me an opportunity to share my experience. Um, and, you know, I, I hope this is helpful. It, it sounds like Homework Help Global in general. It sounds like such a good platform for students. So thank you to all that you guys do. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. Uh, if anyone wants to talk more offline, I'm always available to do that. So do you want yeah. to share your Instagram handle really quick? If, uh, if we can. Yeah. So um, it's pretty easy if you can spell my name. So my, and my name is unique, so you can find me, but yeah, reach out to me on Instagram. It's um, Q A N E T H A dot A H M E D. Kanetha dot Ahmed. We'll so, write yeah. it out as well too. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so thank you. It was nice to e meet you, virtually meet you. Um, and we'll keep in touch with you because uh, I can't wait to see where where you're headed, especially. So, um, again, thank you so much. Sure, I'm happy to be part of this. It was a pleasure. It was my pleasure as well. Bye, Bye. Bye.